One of the beautiful parts of using the traditional one-year series of readings and rubrics and having someone with Al's wisdom picking out the choir pieces, every single thing links together so well, and it's especially noticeable today. Serve the Lord, do the work, be the laborer, heed the call, serve the Lord, do the work, be the laborer, spreading the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And how does this work? The parable that we get in our gospel reading is one of those ideal sets of circumstances. It gives us a good view of all the laborers who begin at different times. We could also apply this more broadly to those who do work in different ways at different times or different times of their lives. The temptation to judge one another according to our works and our deeds, our temptation to think that one sort of work is greater than another within the kingdom of God in Christ, our temptation to be focused on what others are doing instead of what we ourselves are doing, to be focused on others' calling and not our calling. Who wouldn't think it unjust to work all day long and see somebody come in at the last hour and get the same amount of pay. And yet it's not unjust, is it? He, you agreed to getting one denarius for a day's work. You did the work, you got the denarius. What's the problem? None. Is it not up to the owner to do what he pleases with what he owns? Sure, absolutely it is. There's a ton of different variables that you're not thinking about because you're being greedy in that instant. What about the guy that sat there all day thinking he wasn't going to get work today and have nothing to feed his family, but he gets something at the 11th hour? You knew you had a job first thing this morning. There's also the possibility the people hired in the morning are dragging it out, and that's why it's not getting done. They're hoping to come back tomorrow for another denarius, and maybe the people hired later have to work that much faster to meet the quota. If you've ever worked in a factory, you know how some of this works. We don't know that, of course, but we also don't know that it's not. We don't have enough information to look at it in any other fashion than to say the owner can pay what he chooses to whom he is hired. They had an agreement. Your boss that you work for owes you, owes you exactly what you agreed to take the job for, nothing less and nothing more. That's fair. That's just in every worldly sense. It's our greed or our jealousy that makes us think otherwise. All this comes around to the work we do for the kingdom, how we do it, when we do it, where we do it. The Bible is filled with so many wonderful examples of this. Joseph, the patriarch, the son of Abraham, sold off by his brothers, ends up in Egypt, ends up getting an exalted position. And because of his righteousness, he ends up in a dungeon. Because of his righteousness, he gets out of the dungeon. Because of his righteousness, he gets exalted to a high position. The key thing in his life was he did the next right thing. He did the works of the Lord according to the Lord's law. He was diligent, he worked hard, and he told the truth. He did not bemoan where he ended up. He didn't whine and complain about being in the dungeon and refuse to do anything. He worked himself to the bone and got out finding the things he could do diligently as a worker in any situation he was put in. David the king was a shepherd when God chose him to be king of Israel. And David the king was a wise and powerful king. He also was a miserable, wretched sinner who murdered men to steal their wives. But he also was a man who was driven to repentance by the Holy Ghost. His works are, he's given all these incredible blessings and it would be easy to say, why does he get them? Look at what an unrighteous fellow he is compared to me, of course. And yet God chose him and by his repentance, he was absolved. And Solomon, the trust fund baby of ancient Israel who was raised with everything and did it all, we're currently covering Ecclesiastes in women's Bible studies. What did he not party on with? He did it all and was made wise enough by the Lord to regret it. Your life takes these peculiar turns, and sometimes in our wickedness we're not doing what we're supposed to. But the Holy Spirit is in charge. The Word of God continues to be that which runs the universe. The will of the Lord continues to be the only inevitable outcome, for good or for ill, to us based on our faith or faithlessness. Our friend Tobit is an interesting fellow. 
Tobit was born in Israel, but not unified Israel. He was born in Israel, the northern kingdom, after the split of the two kingdoms. He was born in a land that had no less than two golden calves and multiple temples and Asherah poles, the worship of many different gods, the sacrifice of their own children to demons. And yet he was a faithful man, one of the minority that remained faithful in the northern kingdom. And he lived long enough to see the kingdom fall. So he sees that he lives in a kingdom divided and split. He lives in the worst half of that kingdom, the most unrighteous, we would say. He ends up seeing it collapse under the onslaught of the Assyrians and people being butchered en masse. He ends up living in Nineveh in the captivity of the northern kingdom. We don't get a lot of stories like this, literally. Tobit's one of the few that come from that era and then they disappear. The people die off. They give up faith altogether and intermarry. All of those apostates that were already worshiping idols, what's the big deal? The survivors disappear to history. The northern tribes never come back. The southern kingdom will go into captivity shortly after to Babylon, but it will return. And all of that story becomes the rest of our Old Testament. There's not much but these little epitaphs to the northern kingdom. But we get one in Tobit, and it's a cool story. But Tobit lived through the fall of that kingdom, lived in captivity, and he literally finds his place in the world by burying the dead. It may seem odd to us. He finds a peculiar, faithful vocation in burying the dead. Because people of faith deal with their dead in a certain way. Oh, we have a variety of ways now that we do that are acceptable as far as cremation or burial. But how we view death and therefore how we view the remains of our loved ones who will be resurrected at the judgment day, treating it with care and the respect of something that not only has been alive, but will be alive again. The same, the same body, resurrected, restored, made new, made again in every way, cleansed and purified of sin. Now, because of all the different pagan nations of the ancient world had their own customs and the Jews had their own customs, one of the common things you did to enemy nations was desecrate their dead. It was just an ordinary thing to do. If a certain kingdom you conquered believed that the dead must be buried in order to be resurrected, well, you cremated them all on a big funeral pyre to make the point to them that you didn't care about their faith, their religion, or their afterlife. They went out of their way to find out what your customs were to do things the opposite. When the Romans invaded Sarmatia, they staked the bodies on the ground face down with stakes so that they could not accidentally be turned up because those people believed the body had to see the sky for the soul to go to heaven. It's cruel, it's mean, and it just was ordinary human behavior. And so those Israelites that were being purged by the Assyrians, well, they were dumping them outside in the garbage heap. They weren't getting buried. They weren't even getting the joy of cremation. They were being dumped on the garbage heap and left to rot. So no one could remember your grave. No one could visit it. No one could ponder the spot at which you would be resurrected on the judgment day. They threw you out with the garbage and you'd go floating with the sludge down the river. In the most peculiar of seemingly of ways, the faithfulness of Tobit is seen in burying the dead. When you've got nothing else, that's what you've got. The kingdom had fallen. You're living in a pagan, pagan tyranny. But you know in your own people they're being desecrated. And so he would sneak out at night and make sure they had a proper Israelite burial, probably some prayers in Hebrew. This is the reason why it is a criminal offense. What he does, it's considered treasonable. There was a reason why they wanted those people desecrated and him treating the remains with honor was a treasonable insult to the king and to Assyria. What an odd thing, right? Let's ponder this. A son of Abraham who ends up a ruler in Egypt and in Jacob. David was a shepherd who becomes a king. Solomon was born after his father had murdered his mother's first husband. What a mess. And partied it up. Tobit lived in the worst kingdom to see the kingdom fall and be replaced with something worse. But each step along the way, like everyone in the scripture, what is the underpinning moral of the story? God's wisdom, God's law, the works that God has laid out for them to do. 
the things they are called, whether called in the morning or in the evening, called to the vineyard or called to whatever, to be king of a kingdom or to bury the dead, to be like Paul was, faithful, faithful, devoted, fanatic to what he believed was true, to the extent that he persecuted the church, to the extent that when Jesus converted him on the road to Damascus, he would ultimately die for Jesus and for his church. The fanatic turned to a good cause, the labor becoming, the labor being sanctified by the work of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost finds us in the place where we are and makes us into the people that he needs us to be. This is the process of being sanctified in faith. As we say in the catechism, we are called by the gospel, sanctified by his gifts. We are continually sanctified by the work of the Holy Spirit in all circumstances in which we find ourselves. Each of these then are an example to us of what a righteous life looks like, but not righteous because of our choosing our labor or our goodness. And this is the key that underpins it all. The Holy Ghost does the work. You and I are sanctified by the work of the Holy Spirit. We will never do a good thing for only good reasons in this world by the volition of ourselves because we are sinful. We will always be sinner and saint at the same time in this life. But the Holy Ghost gets done all the things that it needs to get done. The Holy Ghost underpins all of the agonizing choices we have to make as Christians, and we do, whether to do this thing or not do that thing, or what the next right thing to do, and to agonize over how much should I do, and where, and where should my efforts be. And yet the secret mystery of all that is that the work of the Holy Ghost is guaranteed. He is in us, working to get all things done. The Lord who drives Jacob, David, Solomon, of Tobit, of Paul, and the reminder of Paul then, to pummel our flesh and subdue it, to not do the things that the world does, to not give in to the temptation to do those things. Sin is a temptation that is often pleasurable, and then it becomes a habit, and then it becomes a necessity. The righteousness of faith is an absolute necessity that if done becomes a habit, and then becomes a pleasurable thing. The spiritual experience of the Christian life, that is something that is earned by time and diligence. It is work done by the work of the Holy Ghost through word and sacrament in Christ's church. By this washing, this absolution, by this Eucharist, by literally filling us with the Holy Spirit that does all things through, through the word and will of the Lord worked in us not by our own volition, in Jesus' name. Amen.